capturing those key ages. So between the ages of 11 and 14, that's the age that's, you know, the age where they go through the change, you know, as far as, you know, where they think, oh, you know, I don't need math and science. You know, that's not cool. Um, Again, you know, as a girl, I don't need math and science, you know, later on in life, you know, that's boy stuff or, you know, that's nerdy stuff, you know, again, stopping that narrative in our middle schools, um, you know, implementing not only those programs in our early childhood education programs, but implementing those programs in our inner city middle schools, um, our recreation centers. So that's the age where they get a little bit lost. And then as they go into high school and they choose a career, they're not even thinking about science, technology, engineering, or math. Hi, everyone. My name is Kate Lance, and I'm the Director of Programs and Communications here at the Creative Coast in Savannah, Georgia. Uh, if you don't know about us, the Creative Coast is a 501c3 nonprofit, and we exist to catalyze the innovation con economy on the coast of Georgia. And we do this through our social and educational programs. Um, and one of those is our lunchtime topics, which you're listening to now. Um, our lunchtime topics is a podcast that happens uh, at least monthly, sometimes twice a month. And we bring on an expert who shares their wisdom with the start of an innovative community here in Savannah, Georgia. Um, and a lot of people recognize the Creative Coast uh, for uh, the adult programs that we offer. So we offer a number of educational programs for startups and founders to uh, help them launch their business and uh, to help them walk, work them through customer discovery to figure out what their who their market is. But another arm of what uh, we we work to do here is to offer educational STEAM opportunities for K through 12 youth. Um, and we do this through workshops and camps, summer camps. And we typically focus on underserved youth for these sessions. And um, we do this because we recognize the opportunity that STEAM careers provide in terms of higher wages and salaries, and then also the need to keep innovation happening in Savannah and to fill all these jobs that are popping up. I mean, we've got the Hyundai plant coming out. It's going to be ready, I think, in 2025, they said, completed. And we've got to fill these jobs in the future um, and prepare our youth today to go and work at um, all the, the new innovative companies that are coming through the ports right now. Um, we're seeing a lot of startup tech startups come through the port. So um, we bring on an expert instructor um, for uh, these classes, and we've had the opportunity over the last couple of years to work with Ambria Birchsteiner, who is the founder and owner of Operation One Step at a Time. And she's worked with us through she worked with us through the pandemic to offer STEAM workshops online for youth, and she's now working with us on Mad Scientist Summer STEAM camps um, at local recreational centers. And so Amber, Ambria is the expert on all things um, STEAM in Savannah, and uh, she's also an engineer by trade. She attended Spelman College, where she was a participant in their dual engineer program, and she finished at Auburn with a dual degree in industrial and systems engineering, and came back to Savannah, where she's from, and um, launched her initiative, Operation One Summit at a Time, which we're going to get into um, Ambria, thank you so much for being here today to talk about uh, building the uh, future workforce with STEAM education. We appreciate you, you coming on. Thank you. Um, I'm always excited to work with the Creative Coast and to spread just more awareness and knowledge about um, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. So, yeah. Well, um, I want to always start with the why, because I think that's so, so important in the startup world. It's important. Whatever you do, it's the thing that leads you um, in your career and, and um, the decisions you make. Right. So can you tell us about your background and why you're passionate about building the future workforce with STEAM education? Okay. Um, my STEM journey is um, not a straight line. It's not linear at all. <laughs> it goes in all many types of directions. Um, but yeah, I gained my first engineering experience um, when I was a senior at, well, a junior actually, excuse me, at Savannah Arts Academy. So there was this program called the Explorer Post Program, and that is something sponsored by the Boy Scouts of Coastal Georgia here in Savannah in the coastal Georgia area. And um, it gives public school students and Boy Scouts as well, the chance to explore different careers in your area um, before you go off to college to help you kind of, you know, filter out what you would like to do. So I thought that, I don't know if you guys can tell, but I love talking to people. I love interacting with people, individuals, um, any type of communication. Um, <laughs> but I really wanted to be the next Don Baker. And if you're not from the Savannah area, that is one of our most popular news anchors, <laughs> a wonderful mentor of mine. And I really thought that that was what I was going to do. Um, I thought I was going to get into journalism of some sort. Um, I was a visual arts major at Savannah Arts. So I thought I was going to hit the streets of New York 
and be this wonderful fashion journalist or um, be behind someone's screen, TV screen, maybe giving the news or something like that. Um, my advisor, um, who I still talk to today, um, Ms. Barbara Foley, she called me and she shattered my dreams. <laughs> she told me that that portion of the program was um you know, full. And so she said, based off of your, you know, interest and in what you told me that, you know, you really like to do and based off of your grades in science and math, I really think that you should participate in the engineering por portion of this program. So, you know, at the time I heard of engineering, but I was not aware of all that branched off from engineering. So, you know, I said, oh, I don't know if I want to do that. That's something new. That's something that I had never really had experience in. Um, but with push from my mother, um, you know, I didn't want to do it, to be honest, uh, and push from Miss Foley, you know, I joined that program and that changed the trajectory of my life. Um, from there, the next year, so I was a engineering apprentice at Thomas and Hutton, um, construction firm, or excuse me, civil engineering firm here in Savannah. Um, and I learned how to survey, read blueprints, et cetera. And so from there, I was on my way. Um, I joined, um, well, I attended Spelman College in the fall of 2013, and I was a participant in their dual degree engineering program where I went on to um, go or attend Auburn University attend Auburn University um, to major in industrial and systems engineering. And if you would have told me, literally, I know it cliche as it sounds, if you told me seven years ago that I would be here talking about how, you know, STEM has changed my life, or I would be talking about how I'm, you know, um, working in the Savannah area, in the area of STEM education, I would have said, no way. <laughs> so, you know, it's just been a blessing. Um, but the why, so the why, just the why is, you know, throughout my story, you know, exposing our students early on to these types of programs, these types of concepts. Um, the, pro the quote that I live by the most is exposure leads to expansion. And um, through the quote, exposure leads to expansion, um, I really feel as though we tell our children, you can be the scientist, you can be this lawyer, you can be this doctor, you can be this engineer, um, but are we really giving them the tools in front of them? Are we really making sure that they have these tools that they need in order to succeed? Um, and so that is, you know, my why, one of my whys, um, my motto for Operation One Sim at a Time is to educate, enlighten, and empower. And I really feel as though, you know, you have to educate the child, you know, um, train the child on maybe what they want to do. They they may, again, they may not be exposed. Um, you have to enlighten the child, you know, engage the child um, in all of these activities and different types of camps and <laughs> all that I do around Savannah, engage them, you know, what piques their interest? How can you connect science, technology, engineering, and math with what they want to do? Um, and you have to empower the child. You have to help them see their, their potential, help them see their their dream or their journey through that is our job I feel as though as mentors mentors and adults um and that is my why with operation one stem at a time it is really um it gives me a warm feeling um when I when children I really I I to this year I think it was this year or last year that I've had children that I um Taught, I think two or three years ago um, with one of my first annual camps and they came up to me and they remembered me and they were so excited and so you know just to have again that interest beyond the classroom is what I really try for. That's awesome well I want to get a little bit more into before we get into some of the questions about current stats today and where things are headed with the future uh, uh, STEAM workforce can you talk a little bit about the types of programs you offer through Operation One STEM at a Time and um, the work you've done in Savannah uh, so far? Yes. Yeah, so um, Operation One STEM at a Time literally started as 10 bullet points <laughs> on a sheet of paper. Um, and it has literally grown from just an idea um, or a pageant platform. I was Miss Savannah USA 2017, 2018. Um, and so what was originally supposed to be a year long program has now developed into um, Operation Summer. That's one of our programs that we provide. So through the Creative Coast and other entities and organizations in Savannah, um, I travel through various recreational centers here in Savannah, um, schools, organizations, etc. And I provide summer programming throughout the summer to children here in Savannah and mostly inner city children that, again, would most likely not have that exposure um, in the year or in the summertime during that time that they're out of school. Um, also, I do Operation STEAM, <laughs> STEM Powered. Steam Rest Empowered, I always say both to uh, make sure I cover both of my crowds, but that is something that the Creative Coast also helps me to provide um, in the year. That is the program where I honor women in STEM throughout the Savannah, not only the Savannah-Shadow County area, but 
the Southeast. So we've had um, individuals from Virginia, Maryland, um, Atlanta, Alabama. Um, these individuals are honored for their efforts to promote as well as myself, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Um, I'm excited to say that Operation One Stem at a Time has implemented their first advisory board. Um, again, it has really been just a journey to see, you know, something that has started as an initiative grow into this 501c3 program, and I'm very um, excited for that journey. Um, and also throughout the year, I speak at various engagements. Um, I just spoke at the Creative Coast Griff Conference, um, Telfair Museum just had their Pulse Art and Technology Festival. So I gave a lecture on, again, STEAM education and why that is imperative to have in our classrooms today. Um, and also, I love this program. I speak at Girls Engineer Day every year. Um, I love working with the Society of Women Engineers um, for the Coastal Empire area. Um, and yes, I'm available for your classroom. So if you would like me to come and do an activity, um, myself or facilitator, um, I am available for that. So yeah. Yeah, and I just want to say Operation um, so Empowered event that we were involved with last year, the front porch, it was so awesome because Ambria brought in all these different women from different STEM uh, fields or STEAM fields, whatever you want to say, <laughs> we, I call it STEM, <laughs> STEM, whatever, same thing, but um, um and it was interesting to hear their stories and some of the challenges that they had to overcome in, uh, working in male-dominated fields and um you know, we're still talking about that today. I know that it kind of sounds like a cliche thing for a lot of people, but it's still a huge, you know, it's still kind of a huge issue. And we're going to get into that a little bit too, about the discrepancies in the workforce and the, and the gaps and things like that. So, but it was so inspiring to hear all the women talking. You had everyone from high school or at Savannah Arts Academy to gosh, um, I think you had your one of your former teachers, right? Yes, Steve? my former mentor, um, Ms. Okay. Melanie Welch. She is a distribution engineer for Georgia Power. Yes. Yeah. And so, sorry, I got, I got that mixed up. Um, but, but the other thing that Ambria does is we're excited to have her work with us this summer. She's going to be running two camps, one at WW Law in July, and mm -hmm. then another at Park um, in the early, early June, I believe. And she runs the Mad Scientist team camp there where they learn all about all kinds of um, different aspects of, of STEM. And so the kids really love that. And um, they really, they told us, you know, this year, all the record centers, like, we really want Ambria back. So um, <laughs> we're excited to do that again. But um, so I want to get into the current state of STEM. We're going to talk about some stats here. Um, the uh, National Science Foundation does a lot of reporting on this stuff. And they ran this report. And the latest one that I could find was from 2022 for science and engineering in the United States, the mm -hmm. state of it. And um, they talk about how um, the United States is actually doing okay when it comes to science, but math is where we're lagging behind. Can you speak on this national issue a bit? A bit? Um, well, there's many factors that go into those numbers. Okay, so if we're starting with the community or the classroom, um, the community and the classroom are very much so related and parallel. So a lot of people think, you know, whenever a child walks into the classroom, whatever happens beyond those doors has nothing to do with what happens at the schoolhouse. And that is not, um, that is not true. Um, you have children that are experiencing poverty. Um, you have to look, and especially our educators, if there are educators on this um, Zoom, you have to look at how poverty affects student achievement. Um, you know, you have students that don't get enough to eat and enough to enough sleep. So you have to think about how all of these factors are affecting their performance in the classroom, not only in science, technology, engineering and mathematics, those particular areas, but in all aspects, socially, mentally, emotionally, um, all of these things, you know, the, ch the child needs to be a whole or a full child <laughs> to be a well-performing child. So you have to look at that. Um, also, and we were actually talking about this a little bit before the Zoom started, but having these um, educators that know how to navigate all types of children, and all types of classrooms. So an inner city school um, and for my Savannah people, um, Haven Elementary would be different than Marsh Point Elementary. So, you know, knowing how to navigate these classrooms in the inner city versus the suburbs. So how can you connect to these students? We have students that have been exposed to these types of concepts since birth. You know, they've had that privilege or they had that, you know, that experience. But also you've had children that, you know, for the first time, you know, Georgia doesn't require students to enter a classroom until they're six years old. So that's first grade. So you have to look at that. There are some students that are not 
in a classroom setting until they enter the first grade. And that is, you know, by law, that's okay. So, you know, looking at your Head Start programs, you know, how are we implementing? I know for Savannah Chatham County Public Schools, we have the ACORN program. Um, so, you know, how are we implementing, you know, these early Head Start programs and how are they implementing, you know, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics are all these concepts that the students will need to su succeed as they, until they graduate, essentially. So, you know, that, and if we're talking about mathematics, you know, math is hard across the board. <laughs> you know, that's just a, a, a subject where you're going to have to, you know, involve all of your, your skills, critical thinking, you know, working with teams, you know, problem solving, um, et cetera. And again, that starts from the beginning. You know, if students don't have those concepts exposed to them at an earlier age, it's going to be a lot harder for them to grasp that as they enter those formative years. So again, third grade, I know a lot of times, Kate, you probably heard it um, drills into your head, the third grade le reading levels, third grade reading levels. So again, yeah. that implements those numbers as well. And, you know, with Savannah Chatham County Public School System, we do have some work to do as far as getting our students to where they're supposed to be in order to meet the criteria when they graduate. Yeah, I wanted to just kind of second some of what you said there and read some stats from that study. Um, uh, so um, these are the current stats. The United States ranks higher in science literacy, seventh out of 37 organizations for the economic cooperation and development countries than it does in mathematics literacy. or 25th out of 37 of those organization for economic cooperation development countries. The average U.S. mathematics score in 2018 was lower than the OECD. That's an abbreviation for the long word organization of economic cooperation development um, mm -hmm. average and mm -hmm. has not measurably changed since 2003, whereas the average U.S. science score was higher than the OEC, OECD average and has improved by 13 points since 2006. And so they also talk about um, the discrepancies among um, uh, ethnicity. So the low international ranking of the United States in mathematics is consistent with the lack of improvement in student achievement for more than a decade. Mathematics scores for Black, Hispanic, Native Hawaiian, or Pacific Islander and American Indian or Alaska Native students persistently lag behind the scores of their white and Asian peers. Among fourth graders in 2019, scores in mathematics were 18 to 25 points lower for students in these racial or ethnic minority groups than for white students. This gap was even wider 24 to 32 points among eighth graders. Asian students consistently outperformed all other groups in both grades four and eight. So you mm -hmm. kind of already addressed this, in, but I don't. if you want to say anything else on it, um, can you delve into this reason for the gap in these STEM scores between ethnicities? Um, you touched on it a little bit there. Um, again, just looking at the disparities in particular neighborhoods. Um, so if we're looking at Savannah Chatham County public school system, um, you know, and we were talking about, you know, having these teachers that are well equipped to go into these different types of classrooms, um, you know, it's great that we're getting all of these new teachers, but do these teachers understand that every child is not the same and every child does not come from the same background? Um, you know, I've seen students that get left behind in the classroom because the teacher is teaching linear, but, you know, you have a student that's kind of hanging out there, you know, in space that does not understand that way. They don't grasp that the way that the, the teacher may present this information is not the way that the student could grasp it. So that's one way. Um, also just looking at, again, exposure leads to expansion. Um, oftentimes um, students that are not minorities, so uh, especially white children, they're exposed to these concepts early on, but you have to look at what's in their particular neighborhood. So they may have those Head Start programs. They may have those private preschool programs um, that are teaching um, them about experiments before they're even five years old. Um, that are teaching them about problem solving, that I'm teaching them, you know, how to solve these problems using critical thinking skills and working with others. So again, having, again, those particular programs in place um, with our, I would say minority, so Black, Hispanic um, groups in particular, you have to look at um, how are we educating our parents? So um, our white or Asian counterparts, they understand some, I would say most understand, okay, you need to have these concepts to succeed, right? Um, and not saying our Black or Hispanic counterparts wouldn't understand that or that those particular groups wouldn't understand that, but 
you know, understanding the importance. So how can these concepts, even if they don't necessarily go to college, let's say they want to participate in a certification program or a two-year program, you know, how do those skills that they learn, you know, between the ages of one and four are going to help them succeed as they become, you know, 18 to 22. So, you know, everything connects and you have to connect the dots when it comes to learning, but it has to be the community connecting with the parent, the parent connecting with the teacher and all that coming together to create this circle that has a balance. So if one thing is off balance, you're not, that student's going to be thrown off their game in a sense. Um, yeah, that's, it's, that's an interesting thing to think about. It's like, you don't know what you don't know. And mm -hmm. I feel like for, for folks that have parents that are working in these STEM industries and have had those opportunities to get the education they needed, um, yes. you know, like dating back, you look at that, that's like a, that's a passing on of knowledge. Like, oh, well, you know, if you graduate in this field, they pay a higher entry level fee and there's a way out that way, you know, like, um, I, it was interesting. You were talking, we were talking about this. I, um, I heard two things when I was growing up. Um, my dad was a web developer. Mm -hmm. Um, and he it was a developer in the 90s. And so I always kind of had that influence on me from him telling me, like, if you graduate in, in the STEM career and your niche, you're more likely to have a higher paying career. And I had that kind of influence. But another thing that I also heard was that girls are not as good at math mm -hmm. and science as boys and that you're probably just not as good. And the funny thing was, I actually was good at it. <laughs> Um, algebra was not my thing. I mm -hmm. really struggled with algebra, but the other, um, like geometry, I loved it. But I remember just hearing that as a kid and that really getting stuck in my head. And, you know, it's funny how, you know, I had that influence of, I did actually graduate with a STEM degree, but it, it, you're just making me think like, when you hear these things in your head, mm -hmm. how much influence they have, like on what you're going to do. Like, if you think you can't do something, and, and you have you're that block because mm -hmm. it was really hard. Like I was always told, well, you're just not good at algebra because exactly. it's just girls tend to be a little behind. And it's also, it's not in your genes. Cause you know, I'm my, my mom would always say, I'm not good at algebra either. And I was like, oh, then I just, That's probably why. yeah. <laughs> but my mom was also my big encourager too, but you know, like, <laughs> it was just like, you know, I think it's because she was told that, like, oh, women mm -hmm. aren't meant to be, you know, it's interesting how that kind of influences. Um, and so I, I want to stand and focus on the solution now, because I've asked you kind of the, the struggle. And um, so so why is it imperative that STEM industries in the United uh, in the United States? Why is it imperative for STEM in industries in the United States that this gap is decreased? Like, what? why is this essential on the whole? Um, well, just innovation. So, you know, as the world is changing, you know, we have to change with the times as cliche as that sounds. So you don't want to essentially get left behind. You don't want it. And especially this is for this generation that is, you know, our teachers and our scientists and our lawyers and our doctors. Now you want to make sure the next generation is equipped for that societal change. Um, you know, when that generation is set and gone, you know, it's going to be millennials and Gen Z left. So are millennials and Gen Z equipped to, you know, be in these particular technical roles, you know, um, have they left the tools behind in order for us to succeed and us, including myself, because I am a millennial, um, you know, and that comes with growth and that comes with change. Um, a lot of times I would say the older crew, um, does not maybe want to share the knowledge so that we can all share in the wealth, you know, that has to be acknowledged as well. Um, but also, I would say, you know, you have to be willing, again, to have that balanced circle. So you have to be willing to have a community that's willing to change. You have to be willing to have that parent that's now been educated about why these careers are important. And you have to have the parent that's motivated to say, hey, I'm going to put my child in the mad scientist program, you know, or put my child in this STEAM, um, this special STEAM related um, Head Start program, or, you know, have that teacher that's going to incorporate these technical aspects in her lesson plans. Um, and it also, like you were saying, how people say, oh, well, girls aren't good at X, Y, and Z. Our boys are better at X, Y, and Z. Um, I saw a quote the other day that said, girls are taught to be perfect and guys are just taught to, to do, um, to provide. So you have to look at that. Um, I have girls that will erase their paper a hundred times and boys 
will give me an answer, but they tried. So I have some girls that I'll go around the table and I'll say, oh, you know, did you not understand it? And they say, I understood it, but I didn't want to give you a wrong answer, Miss Ambria. And when I speak to young boys, um, they say, well, you know, I know it's wrong, but I still wanted to just, you know, give you something. So you have to look at that, even though that's something that's small, that's significant because that girl is told, oh, you know, you're going to be told X, Y and Z if you provide a wrong answer or something that's not, you know, right. You know, that's seen as in society as wrong, you know, a girl has to be again, perfect, or she has to be good at everything that she does. Well, a boy has that room to grow. So we have to stop that narrative and say, you know, all children can grow in these particular areas. You know, it's okay to make mistakes. It's okay to, you know, you may be behind now, but you know, you can catch up, you know, by the time you graduate or leave elementary or middle school, capturing those key ages. So between the ages of 11 and 14, that's the age that, you know, the age where they go through the change, you know, as far as, you know, where they think, oh, you know, I don't need math and science. You know, that's not cool. Um, Again, you know, as a girl, I don't need math and science, you know, later on in life, you know, that's boy stuff or, you know, that's nerdy stuff, you know, again, stopping that narrative in our middle schools, Um, you know, implementing not only those programs in our early childhood education programs, but implementing those programs in our inner city middle schools. Um, our recreation centers. So that's the age where they get a little bit lost. And then as they go into high school and they choose a career, they're not even thinking about science, technology, engineering, or math. Um, And just letting them know that, you know, even if they don't necessarily want to major or have a career that science or seem, excuse me, related, they're going to need these tools to succeed. Everything connects. Everything is woven together. Um, And yeah, I would say that, I would say that would be a solution. That would be a couple of solutions, I would say, to close that gap. Um, And especially, so we're talking about the Hyundai plant, right? The Hyundai plant is probably going to be here within the next five years. So, you know, can we look at the Savannah, Chatham County metro areas, so Effingham County, Chatham County, Bryan County, um, Liberty County, and can we honestly say, because in the next five years, our middle school kids are going to be graduated and gone. Um, So can we honestly say that these students are equipped to, you know, get a job at one of the, I would say, top five motor companies in the world? You know, are we preparing them now so that when they leave, we're able to have local talent in these positions and not necessarily people from out of town. Because I would say a lot of the discussion I've been hearing is, oh gosh, this plant is going to bring a lot of people from out of town. This plant is going to bring a lot. Where are they going to fill all the jobs from? Yes. And where, how are they going to, and that shouldn't even be a question, you know, you know, um, that shouldn't even be a question that we pose to our community. Our question should be instead of, oh gosh, where are they going to get this talent from? How are we going to equip our students and even our young adults to be prepared for when this particular plant comes in what, 2027, six, I don't know if I have it right, but (laughs) I got claps. Thank you, Amy. (laughs) So I I think that's, again, that's one of the reasons instead of looking outward, we need to look in. Yeah, my next question was going to be too about um, why developing the uh, educational opportunities is important for individuals. But I feel like it could be good now to just kind of read some of the stats that they found. These are things that we've known for a while. Mm -hmm. um, and We've been trying to really impress upon um, influential leaders in the community. It's that Um, So here's the quote directly from the National Science Foundation. Workers in STEM occupations have higher median earnings and lower unemployment than their non-STEM counterparts. In 2019, Mm -hmm. STEM workers earn a median annual salary of $55,000, and non-STEM workers earn a median annual salary of $33,000. Also in 2019, unemployment was lower among the STEM labor force, 2%, than the non-STEM labor force, 4%. This pattern held during the economic downturn associated with the coronavirus pandemic. Um, and I just got to say, too, is like one thing we're finding, like entry level jobs are typically like anywhere from 10 to 20,000 higher for STEM careers than they are mm-hmm. for non-STEM careers. And a lot of times, like think talk about coding, you know, we, we talk about that here with our program Girls Code. Uh, you don't necessarily have to have a four year degree. I've talked to so many people that are um, um, web developers now who they either went through a boot camp or they're self-taught. They learned for Python on YouTube and yes. or went through, they did code academy courses online. 
Um, but I, I want to, I want to delve into something you mentioned too, is like the essential ages of catching youth. And this is something we focus on here, um, or, or middle school age, because those numbers, and I don't have the stats in front of me right now, but what we've seen and what the, you know, based on all these reports out there is that, um, like Microsoft did a study, I think not too long ago, a few years ago, and they found that like the num- the rate at which inter- uh, women, especially their interest in STEAM, it drops off in middle school significantly. And then again, in high school, if it's not reinforced. So yes. one thing I've also read is that, and can you speak to this a little bit? It's like, you already talked about that. It can't just be in the school. It's at home. It's in the school. It's every everywhere. But like, if you... We can't just have like a single touch with STEM for the, for students. It's good for them to have more opportunities to advance beyond just that single touch. And that's something we really aim for with our work is like, if if we're just aiming for as many, reaching as many students as we can through one program, and then we just let them go, then you're not really you're not really keeping them engaged, but having these outside activities, like you're offering at these rec centers and with us and, it's a way to keep students engaged beyond the classroom. And can you talk about the importance of that? And maybe even this is a good time to work in the A to the STEAM, to the STEM. Um, I don't know. You tell me. Um, uh, yeah, I guess I could talk about, okay, because there's this debate about STEAM and STEM. You know, I'm a STEM girl, so I'm always going to be on the STEM side. But yes, we do have to have that art concept um, in there, I would say, uh, <laughs> as well. I hate to say that. I'm sorry, you guys. But yes, <laughs> we have to have those art concepts in there because, okay, those are, those connect in a lot of ways that people don't understand. So if we're talking about arts, so if I had to talk about it from the angle that I came in, so I, again, I was a student at Savannah Arts Academy. I was a visual arts major. And I was, you know, when I decided to major in um, a STEM related field, so engineering, I said, well, gosh, how is this going to help me, you know, as I, you know, I, I waste, I won't say I wasted four years, but, you know, I just spent four years as an art major. How is, um, you know, sketching and still life and measurements and, you know, seven head figures and all that going to help me? as I develop in my career. And honestly, you'd be surprised at how much I had to use those particular art or visual arts skills in my particular area. So I would say engineering graphics, that's of course I had to take. That's literally what it sounds like. Engineering graphics, you know, learning how to um, take your ideas from your mind and put it on paper. So AutoCAD, um, automated computer, um, computer aided design. So learning how to not only sketch um, in 2D, but sketch in 2D on the computer and maybe one day turn that into 3D. Um, blueprint sketching. So learning how to draw to scale, you know, so that ratio, um, learning again, math, science, art, technology, all of that comes together. So those are just ways that um, I would say that you would, work that A, are the arts in there? I know that's but that's literally like one of the number one questions I get. Um, you know, why is it STEAM and not STEM? But, you know, it all comes together. Um, even fashion designers, you know, learning how to make something a particular size. The work is like never done, right? Like if you have someone that's excited, how do you keep feeding it to them? You know, like how do we come along and support? And can you talk about the, actually for the Savannah Arts Academy, you mm-hmm. told me this program a million times. They got you interested in engineering. What is the name of it again? And you had a teacher that explore post program. So because I was in the engineering portion of this program, so it's the communication explorer program. There's the engineering explorer post program. There's the medical explorer post program. So they literally have areas um, and it's once a month or every other month, depending on how your schedule goes. Um, And I'm not sure how that would work for someone that does not have transportation. I you know, had a car our, my senior year. Um, I'm a twin. So me and my sister, we had a <laughs> we had a car. So we were able to, you know, go to the sessions. Um, you get a day off of school. I think that motivated a lot of the students that that participated because you get that day off. But <laughs> the Engineering Explorer Post program is something that is still going on today. Like Miss Barbara um, asked me always to come to some engineering meetings um, and, you know, just talk about how, you know, 10 years ago, literally 10 years, I graduated from high school, um, how this program changed my life and how I would say a lot of times I don't think what is explained to students is how much that they have at their fingertips for free. So, you know, um, I wish someone had told me about dual enrollment 
um, and how it, um, instead of AP classes, that would get you your college credits for free. You know, you're able to take these particular classes or it, the engineering explorer post program or the explorer post program as a whole, you know, participating in this um, monthly or bi-monthly you know, program that would get you in front of these businesses that could one day give you an internship while you're in college or a job. I've seen a lot of my friends that were in that program go back and work for the particular um, particular company or organization that they were an explorer for, you know, five, six, 10 years ago. Um, you know, all of these programs, so SLP, Student Leadership Program, and I really don't think students grasp how that is a blessing. That's a benefit for them. Um, and I really hope that the teachers are drilling into them that, hey, take advantage of all that you can, because once you leave high school or once you leave the public school system or not even public private school system or just your K through 12 years, you're not going to have all this available to you um, in this sort of capacity again. So, yeah, take advantage um, of everything. If no, students are seeing this later. <laughs> yeah, that's so important. I'm glad that you said that, too. It's like. Um, there, there are a lot of opportunities out there and there are a lot of folks working to provide these free opportunities. I want to say we have our, we, not only are we working in Ambria, we have our free girls code camp yes. this summer that's coming up. It's going to be really cool. And they're going to learn, um, hopefully we're going to get them in airplanes and then they're going to learn about oh, cool. games based on airplanes. So please, we're trying to spread the word about all these programs. Ambria's Mad Scientist Camp. I'm trying to make sure those don't compete so people can go to both. But I think you have to be a member of the rec centers, right? In order to go to the- um, No, I believe the rec centers. Oh, because people have asked me about this. Yes, for the upcoming programs at WW Law and Park, they handle registration separately. So I do not handle that. Are the Creative Coast does not handle that. You know, we receive the kids that they- um, you know, allow us to have um, that have, you know, paid for that particular program. Um, and so if you are interested in participating in any of Operation One Seven at a Times camps this summer, um, I would say look out for those dates from Park. So the Pennsylvania Avenue Resource Center that's across from Savannah High on Pennsylvania Avenue um, and also WW Law. I forgot what street that's on. I think it's Bolden. I know it's off of Ott, but um, WW Law is a public library. So it's a part of the Live Oak Public Library um, system. So just look for those particular STEM or STEAM camps. Um, anything else I should highlight? Um, well, I was going to ask you, is there anything we did? We, we skipped around a bit. That was my fault. Cause we, we got into some mm -hmm. deeper on some things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I got excited about certain things you said. And I was like, mm -hmm. <laughs> to that. um, but I think, um, you know, I guess we could talk about this. You kind of already said it too, but we didn't talk about promotion, uh, especially, um, what are some steps people can take? Like if there's teachers on the call or just people that are interested in STEAM education that people can take locally to promote STEAM education. We talked about all these free opportunities, hint, hint, poo, poo, <laughs> if anybody can share those and what Ambria just said, but like, um, you talk, you talked about the society of women engineers. Mm -hmm. um, are there any others that I'm missing too? Like um, the or National Association of Women in Construction, they just had their construction week. And literally, um, I just went to some of the events, even though I'm not, I don't participate in anything that has to do with construction on the career side, you know, that's still STEAM related. Um, and those are still somewhat my colleagues. So, you know, I went and I was exposed to a lot of individuals and especially young millennials um, in the Savannah area that are in those particular um careers um who else yeah so society of women engineers um i'm trying to think nesby so the national society of black engineers um you know they have their national conferences going on right now and you do not have to be in college or um in nesby juniors so k through 12 in order to participate in those particular activities um they have something called nesby professionals so again if you want to just learn more about um you know, Black engineers in our experience, you can join the National Society of Black Engineers. That's great. Um, that was um, pivotal for my career um, as someone who uh, has an engineering background, just meeting different engineers um, and other Black engineers across the country. Um, again, anything Creative Coast. I have learned so much since I have partnered with the Creative Coast. I take some of their workshops as well. So even though I am a partner, <laughs> I still learn. Um, certification. So certifications are not only for you know, students that may not have that four year, that traditional four year um, college option. Um, certifications can get you a long way. So I've had um, friends that I've met that gain their certifications in coding. So um, I know Georgia Tech, their seismic uh, 
uh, program, as we were talking, they provide different types of professional development um, certifications, STEM tech, coding, project management, program management certification. So look out for those. Um, any, I would say local, yeah, I would, let me back that up, actually. Any local university that's in your community, our technical, our community school, they are going to have some sort of certification program, our programs in place. So research those. Um, sometimes those are free. Sometimes those are only a couple of hundred, do- a hundred of dollars versus thousands of dollars um, per semester. And you could literally still get, I think we're losing the art of trade or the art of certification. So we're losing that's getting lost because, you know, you're only, again, thinking linear. Um, You're thinking that, okay, I have to go to college. I have to graduate. I have to go to medical school. I have to go. No, you can literally, your path can be what you make it and it can be tailored to your particular, um, your particular background or depending on what you can do at that particular time. Um, After school, I still have gained certifications, you know, scrum master. Um, I'm just naming off different things that, people could do or people could um, get into if they um, can't particularly, like I said, get that traditional schooling or if they just want to gain more knowledge in the STEM areas or technology particularly areas. Okay. So I have one more question before you go, because we've talked mm-hmm. about that in the past, but or I don't, I don't know if this is still an initiative you're working on based on research in Denver. Are you still working on blueprints to STEM, the library? Yes. I do want to focus. I do want to talk about exposure. Mm-hmm. It's, that initial exposure is can change your life, right? And yes. you work heavily on that too. Is like, how do we spread awareness about this so much that people keep coming back for more and they're yes. excited about this? So can you talk about Blueprints to STEM a little bit? Yes. So I started Blueprints to STEM based off ex- of exposure leads to expansion. Or again, we expect our children to major are, you know, go into these particular fields. But again, what are we giving them the tools, you know, what tools, what um, materials are we giving them? What classes are we giving them in order for them to succeed? So um, hashtag blueprints to STEM (laughs) is a literacy initiative, not only to um, help to raise our literacy rates um, within the Savannah Chatham County um, area, but also to provide STEM libraries in um, our local recreation centers um, and community centers here around the Chatham County area. And again, um, I'm working on that. I pray we had a pilot program um, at Connection Church here in Savannah. So hopefully I've been in talks with Park about that particular idea. So hopefully, hopefully within the next year or two, we can get our first STEM library at one of these locations, um, just besides your local libraries. But um, sometimes um, and I'm just going to be honest, students don't go to the library, but they will sometimes regularly go to their community center mm-hmm. over there versus their library. So, you know, meeting the children where they are, um, having things in place wherever they may be so that they can gain that knowledge always or consistently. Um, yes, I'm excited. Hashtag blueprint system. If anyone gets the name, that was probably the most clever thing that I came up with. Um, <laughs> um print system. So just having, um, science, technology, engineering, or mathematics related um, content or um, literature works in these particular libraries so that students can take these home um, and be exposed. So, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. I remember one thing you said when talking about that is like so many people like here, you can be anything you want to be, but mm-hmm. then they no one really tells you how to do it. Like you hear it on TV, you hear it, you know, and it's supposed to encourage you, but then Um, it can seem overwhelming. So if you have access to uh, kind of these resources and libraries where you learn about these different STEM careers and STEM opportunities and what STEM is, it can kind of pique your interest when it explains it in a way that makes it more fun to understand. And that's so exciting to me. And uh, to me, it's just a way to keep people attracted to to STEM. Like there's not really a ton of, um, you know, I think when you go to the library, you're inundated with all kinds of books. But if there's something just focused on that, that's right in front of you, it's like, what is this? And then you even talked about having like workshops in there to keep kids, um, you know, engaged and showing them the different yes. aspects of what they're learning about, which I thought was so cool. So anyways, I wanted to bring, I wanted to make sure you got a chance to talk about that. But that's um, my project. Um, that's, that's under work. So look out for that. Hopefully, hopefully, prayerfully by 2024. That's awesome. Okay, so if people want to go to connect, if people want to connect with you, where's the best place they can do that online? 
So um, I love social media. I love connecting with people. Again, that communications aspect. So please, 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 if you would just want to see anything that Operation One Step at a Time is doing um, locally um, or in our particular metro area, please follow us on Facebook at Operation One Stem at a Time. So that's one spelled out, O-N-E-S-T-E-M. Um, and also on Instagram, Operation One Stem at a Time. And you will see all of the various speaking engagements that um, you know I myself get to participate in. Um, and also um, our various camps and even lunch and learns like this, you know, so you can know where we are at all times and what we're doing to uplift the young students here in Savannah. 